Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Eugene's October 4th, 2024 program on Measure 118, the Corporate Tax Revenue Rebate for Residents. My name is Andrew Kalik and I am City Club's president. We're coming to you from our new home at the historic Wow Hall in the heart of downtown Eugene and it's my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our speakers and to all of you joining us here in person, online, and over the radio. Since 1990, City Club has been dedicated to our founding mission to build community vision through open inquiry. In accordance with our mission and purpose, we hope to help connect people throughout our community and across generations, identities, experiences, and perspectives. You are invited this week and every week to join us in this effort, to share your wisdom, to learn something new, and to take active steps to make a difference in this city and region that we love. Of course, we cannot do this work alone, so a special thank you to our Platinum, Community, and Diamond sponsors. The Eugene Area Chamber of Commerce, serving as a catalytic leader in creating a vibrant and diverse economy that drives economic opportunity and well-being. Kaiser Permanente, which exists to provide high-quality, affordable health care services and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. More information at www.kp.org. The University of Oregon has helped Oregonians question critically, think logically, reason effectively, communicate clearly, act creatively, and live ethically since 1876. More information at uoregon.edu. Lane Community College transforms lives through learning. LCC provides comprehensive, accessible, high-quality educational opportunities that promote student success. For more information, visit lanecc.edu. And thank you to the City of Eugene and to Lane County for their support as well. I'm happy to turn the mic over to the coordinator of today's program, Fabio Andrade, who will introduce the panelists and our moderator from KLCC. Fabio. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, on behalf of the City Club Program Committee, I welcome you to our program on Measure 118, uh, Corporate Tax Revenue Rebate for Residents. In this program, we will hear from Antonio Hisbert, a main petitioner for Measure 118, explain the reasons for a yes vote on it. Angela Wilhelms, representing a coalition opposing the measure, will present the reasons for a no vote. After their brief presentations in the break, uh, Rachel McDonald, host of All Things Considered on KLCC, will moderate a Q&A, and we hope that with those questions, voters can make informed decisions before casting their ballots. With that, I welcome Antonio Hisbert for his presentation, followed by Angela Wilhelms. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Hisbert. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the chief petitioner of Measure 118. It is fantastic to be here with all of you. Can you all hear me? No. Close to the mic. Okay, this, how about this? <clears throat> Forgive me. Um, let's try again. Hello, everybody. My name is Antonio Gisbert. I use he, him pronouns. I am the chief petitioner of the Oregon rebate, which is now measure 118. And it is a pleasure to be back here in Eugene, uh, the, the birthplace of uh, Measure 118. Um, before we talk about the details of the campaign, I want to just talk for a minute about uh, our Oregon system of direct democracy. Uh, as we, I think we know, there's, the Oregon system uh, has uh, basically three ways of doing ballot initiatives in the state. First is a legislative referral. That is when the legislature, either at large or especially the ones which pass a law, the legislature refers uh, measures to the voters to vote uh, yes or no on. Secondly, we have ballot initiatives that are drafted by special interest groups, and um, those are normally like super well funded and with like brand names that um, that we all know. And then third, and sort of like the heart and soul, I think of the Oregon system are ballot initiatives that are drafted by regular Oregonians, just community members coming together to imagine a more just Oregon in their own vision and, and put that law through. Uh, 
I want to submit that it's really important to keep in mind that the Oregon Rebate and Measure 118 is the third type of ballot initiative. In fact, uh, Oregon Rebate was born in 2018, 2019, a few steps away from here at Killer Burgers, where uh, two friends in the middle of the conversation thought that it'd be great if giant corporations started to pay their fair share in taxes and that the people of Oregon would have a better, an easier time to make ends meet. From that conversation, uh, we organized about a dozen uh, friends from mostly Eugene area, uh, people who you might know some of these folks, uh, but I'll protect their names. Um, uh, and we started meeting about every two weeks at community spaces like, like, um, like Theo's Coffee to draft the full text of this initiative. It's really just four pages long. I had there's copies up in the front. And really, it's really important to keep in mind that we're really not talking about a candidate, a person, myself. We're really talking about the ideas expressed in that document. Uh, I just forgot to mention this. Uh, but of course, uh, the 12 folks who drafted this initiative, not famous people, but super smart people uh, with a super diverse um, lived experience um, and, uh, and just overall regular, like awesome community members. So anyway, um, when we started, right, we had two values that, was, that guided our conversation. Number one is this idea of like tax fairness. We thought that it'd be important for corporations to pay their fair share in taxes, just like we, as regular folks, pay our fair share in taxes. Currently, giant corporations like Comcast, after $25 million of income, pay less than 0.12% in taxes, while you and I today pay between 4.75% and 9.9% in taxes. That to us seemed like it was just absolutely like unjust, and so we took a step to try to bridge that gap. The second value that we have is one of like uh, affordability, being able to make ends meet, and everybody being equally deserving of the good things in society. And this is how we structure um, the Oregon rebate, now measure 118. It is a fact that uh, today, about 44% of Oregonians cannot afford to, uh, to cover their monthly costs. And you know, maybe if we have short memories, we think that that is a problem of today, but really it's not. Like I said, we started this work back in 2018 and things haven't gotten better. Obviously there was a global pandemic that didn't help anything. Also like a ton of excess death, which is an even worse thing. But let's keep in mind that like the rich keep on getting richer. The richest corporations keep on getting bigger and richer while you and I continue to struggle to make ends meet. Um, some details about the uh, ballot initiative is that we try to make it as simple as possible. And at the core, the first thing that, the, that Mr. Wellington does is that it increases the minimum corporate tax rate after $25 million of in-state revenue by 3%. Again, that number currently is less than 0.12%. And we feel at 3% is a reasonable first step. It gives room for further tax increases, if appropriate. And it also provides a substantial amount of new revenue to make a, an impactful difference in our, like, present lives. It's really important to note that it doesn't matter where the corporation is based. So for example, Comcast based in Philadelphia will have to pay the 3% the after $25 million of in-state revenue. And Nike will only pay the 3% for their sales or revenue in the state of Oregon. Whatever Nike sells in California, Europe, or China, that remains untaxed by the state of Oregon. Um, last detail, the first $25 million for, 
for these corporations is essentially tax-free, uh, which is, I think, a benefit that like you and I don't have. Could be wrong. <clears throat> okay, so uh, according to legislative re the Legislative Revenue Office, uh, this change in the tax law is going to generate about $7 billion a year in new revenue. Okay, and so what do we do with that? First and foremost, that, you, that new revenue pays for the operation of the program, right? And so the Oregon River is on Measure 118 is designed to be revenue neutral. At the end of all the money that comes in, first and foremost, pays for the program and associated costs, and then whatever is left over goes out to the people of Oregon in a form of a yearly rebate. Most people will claim their rebate when they file their taxes, and it'll be a little bit like a second kicker, if you will, that you'll get every year. But we also build in a provision so that people can claim their rebate before or after they file taxes. In that case, you, those folks will get their money as cash. The value of the rebate is expected to be, according to the Legislative, Le according to the legislative Revenue Office, about $1,600 per person per year once the program is fully implemented a year for, in 2027. And, um, and also, according to the Legislative Revenue Office, when people claim the rebate when they file their taxes, it's going to have the effect, the rebate will basically pay people's taxes or people's organ taxes. And, and the, their calculus is that the typical Oregon personal income tax return will go down by about 2100 bucks. That's tax relief for you and me and everybody else. And that uh, people filing taxes with less than about $40,000 of income will basically not pay any taxes. The rebate will just pay their taxes for them. So that's amazing. Um, from independent research, so I want to say, uh, I forgot to say this before, forgive me. Every person in Oregon is equally, we feel is equally deserving of this rebate, and every person in Oregon will receive this rebate. And that importantly includes kids and dependents. So this is super important for families, right? So it'd be 1600 bucks for me, but also be 1600 bucks that I'll get for any dependents that I might have. So like a four person household will get about 6,400 bucks every year. That is like, that's a chunk of money that we can use, not just to make our lives better, but also to improve our communities through economic, uh, the economic stimulus uh, effect of these rebates. Just some numbers, yeah. In Eugene, we have about 178,000 people. Uh, the combined value of all these rebates is about $286 million every year. Again, $286 million every year. That's a ton of money in downtown Eugene, right? Folks are gonna be able to come to one, are gonna be able to afford to come to one more event at the Wow Hall or get another cup of coffee at Theo's, right? That's a ton of money. In Lane County, it's even more, right? It's like $610 million. That's a ton of money, particularly when you talk to like civic-minded folks, right? There's, always a, there's a, always a struggle for finding revenue. Here's, a, here's one possible solution, right? This money is not gonna enrich our lives individually, but also enrich our communities. Um, uh, in my last couple of minutes, I want to point out that um, that the question in front of us, voting yes or no on Measure 118, is really a question about values and what do we care about more. We have stats that suggest that the Oregon rebate is going to reduce child poverty between like about 50, by about 50 percent in the state of Oregon. That kind of makes sense, right? Because families with, with kids, because the kids get the rebate, right? Families get a big benefit from this program. So one of the values that we have is, what do we value more as a society? Do we want to, do we value more helping folks make ends meet and having corporations 
pay their fair share in taxes, or, and also um, boosting the economic uh, mobility and activity in our communities, or do we value more corporate profits? That's really the deal. Um, I looked this up, and this, I looked this up in the public library, so this number might not be exact, but I think it should be close. There's about 134 companies in Eugene that, that might have to pay the additional 3% after $25 million. Most of the corporations that are going to be paying for this are like Comcast. They're global multinational corporations. They're not really going to care to pay 3% more in the small market of Oregon for Comcast. And so there's 134 corporations in Eugene that might have to pay the 3%. There's also 178,000 people whose lives are going to be materially improved. And that's our choice for us. Uh, please, if you have a second, uh, go to yes or measure118.com to learn more. And thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon. It's good to be back in Eugene. I moved away from here a few years ago, and I'm, I have the fortune of coming back several times throughout the year for track and other events I volunteer at, and it's, um, I miss it. It's, such a, it's just a great community, and I appreciate what the City Club does for the community year-round, not just at election time, but um, it is particularly important as we enter these election seasons to have these discussions. This is a serious issue that deserves serious attention to the facts, to the research, and to the actual language of what was put on the ballot by the petitioners. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know from the measure's own text, from the Nonpartisan Legislative Revenue Office and Nonpartisan Legislative Council's office, from a number of economists, from business owners, including those not directly taxed, and from a host of diverse organizations who have come together as a coalition to defeat Measure 118. In simplest terms, Measure 118 is a costly tax on sales. It's not a tax on profits or income, it's a tax on sales that will make goods and services in Oregon more expensive by driving up costs. It will make Oregon companies less competitive, it will drive a hole in the state's budget, it will result in fewer jobs, lower wages, lower incomes, and ultimately it will cost everyone, individuals, families, even local governments, more. So let's start with being clear and specific about what the measure does. Measure 118 adds a 3% gross receipts tax, a sales tax, on a corporation's annual sales of goods and services above 25 million in Oregon as a new corporate minimum. Just a reminder, the corporate minimum tax is paid if that obligation is higher than a company's corporate income tax obligation. So a company pays either income tax or the corporate minimum, whichever is greater. This modifies the minimum side of that equation. Again, the tax applies to sales. It doesn't apply to profits or income. So any comparisons made between this proposal and the existing corporate income tax structure are frankly inappropriate. As a tax on sales, it's also indifferent to a company's profitability. A company will have to pay if they make a large profit, a small profit, or even no profit at all. The tax applies to the sale of all goods and services without exception sold by these corporations. So it applies to food, home or renter's insurance, car insurance, gasoline, even medicine and medical services like chemotherapy. The tax makes businesses in Oregon and Oregon products less competitive because there's an incentive to move early stages of the supply chain out of the state. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Measure 18 is the largest tax increase in Oregon's history. As Antonio noted, it's estimated to raise about $7 billion annually. For context, that equates to 42.5% of the state's general fund. This is a massive tax increase. 2,401 businesses are taxed directly throughout the state under the current filings. 
But every Oregon business and consumer will ultimately be indirectly taxed, and I'll come back to that as well. There's also a significant administrative burden with this program. The Department of Revenue estimates it needs 199 new people just to determine eligibility for the rebates and help prevent fraud. The Legislative Revenue Office last week in legislative hearings reminded us that there are actually no estimates to the total price tag for this because it is so complex, so convoluted, and so greatly based on things the state agencies don't even know how to estimate or easily measure. Let's go back to the supply chain issue for a second. This proposal creates a gross receipts tax, as we mentioned, but this is different than a normal sales tax. It can apply at every step of the supply chain that happens in Oregon. A traditional sales tax happens once at the final point of sale when you're buying your groceries, or for, for those of us in Oregon, when we're traveling somewhere and buying our souvenirs. It's not a value-added tax, which some states have, and that applies only on the marginal value added to a product at each stage of the supply chain. This applies to gross sales at each stage. That's particularly damaging to Oregon products. Let's use a two-by-four as an example. If the timber is harvested in Oregon, milled in Oregon, sold to a, re a wholesaler or distributor in Oregon, then sold to a retailer, and then ultimately to the consumer who simply wants to fix a fence or build a patio, that two-by-four, the sale of it, and we know there are companies directly affected by this tax at every step of the supply chain I just went through, that two-by-four will be taxed at every step along the way. This is really not complicated. When you tax sales, you have higher prices. When you tax sales at multiple stages of the supply chain, you have even higher prices. And there's a perverse incentive in that structure to move especially earlier stages of the supply chain out of Oregon. And I want to reiterate, it taxes everything. A lot of states that have sales taxes or gross receipts taxes have some exemptions. This has none. Again, food, gasoline, insurance, even rent, let alone the renter's insurance, and medicine. Measure 118 is a regressive tax. It is widely known and widely accepted by economists that gross receipts tax are regressive. That means that they hit those who can least afford them the hardest, people on low and fixed incomes. The higher prices are not what Oregonians need right now. Today, in 2024, an Oregonian household has to spend $11,000 more to buy the same things it bought in 2021. Increases in cost affect all consumers. Consumers, individuals like you and me, households, but consumers are also small businesses. Consumers are also local governments. In fact, state and local governments will see their costs go up $600 million a year as a result of this. That's $600 million less in services or potentially more in local revenues to make up for that loss without any appreciable benefit to the people who rely on those services. All of this is just some of the reasoning why small businesses, in particular, are so worried about Measure 118. This is not about a few big corporations. This is about main streets and communities across the state. A local restaurant would be forced to increase menu prices because of a litany of costs that are going to go up. Health insurance for their employees, the food and beverages they provide, especially if those were manufactured in Oregon, operational costs, paper supplies, credit card swipe fees. I could go on and on. Yesterday, I was in a meeting with a group of small business owners in Salem, mostly just like one or two person shops, an HVAC repairman, landscaper, an insurance agent or two, tech support guy, and all of them agreed this would make their costs go up and put their business at jeopardy. I want to talk for a second about an impact we haven't yet discussed, which is the state, yeah, sorry, just keeping track which is the hole that this punches in the state budget. Whether intended or not, the proponents wrote a measure that fundamentally restructures taxation in a way that redirects current corporate income tax payments to the general fund away from the general fund and into this redistribution program. This is widely acknowledged by legislative revenue, legislative fiscal, legislative council, the governor, the budget committee chairs, Speaker Fahey here from Eugene, the Senate President, and others. It creates a multi-billion dollar hole in the state's general fund. That's the fund that funds schools, public safety, 
behavioral health, healthcare, other human services, and other critical services. Again, that's because corporations won't pay the corporate income tax, which is 6.6 .6 or 7.6% right now. They'll instead pay this minimum into the rebate program. The proponents have suggested that the legislature can simply fix this. And, and legally, that's true. The legislature can modify this measure in any way it sees fit. There's going to be an incentive for them to plug that budget hole. I was talking to the speaker about this earlier this week. There's going to be that incentive. And they do that either by taking the distribution from people, by raising more taxes potentially, restructuring in other ways. I don't know. They have any option they want before them. But so the idea that this is somehow a promise of money to people is simply false. There is no guarantee families will see this money. There is no guarantee they'll see it at the rates being purported. The other thing families are going to have to wrestle with is how to pay Uncle Sam. This money is taxable as federal income. So if a family gets this on their income tax as a credit, they're going to have to come up with the cash to pay Uncle Sam probably around 20% if you take averages and, and means. Let's also focus for a second on who the people are who get this rebate. Measure 118 never actually uses the word resident or Oregonian in its text. We're in a college town. If you're a student from Boston or Austin or Santa Barbara and you come to the University of Oregon and you live here for 201 days, according to the text of that measure, you're eligible to receive the redistribution. Conversely, if you're a kid from Eugene who even works here in the summer and pays income tax, you choose to go to Boise State or somewhere else, if you live outside of Oregon for enough days, you could be ineligible to receive the rebate. That may not be as intended, I understand that, but that's certainly what is written. So Measure 18 sort of belies common sense on so many different levels. But I don't want you to take my word for it. And I know the folks on the radio can't see all these quotes, but they can go to our website, knowonmeasure118.com. But here are just a few of the quotes from some very diverse organizations about the measure's deep flaws. It will increase the cost of construction. It's deeply threatening to Oregon's economic health and has obvious flaws. It's a half-baked idea. Those two were in editorials that came out opposed to the measure this week. It will harm public services. As Tax Fairness Oregon said, it's a hot mess. This is why several hundred organizations and businesses have opposed Measure 118. You can view that list again on our website, knowonmeasure118.com. You can see even more names, Oregon Education Association, Oregon League of Conservation Voters, Oregon AFL-CIO, SEIU. You can see all of those folks listed in opposition to this measure at OregoniansOppose118.com. But as I said at the top, ultimately this is about the measure before voters today. It's not about what we hope can be accomplished or what we want to be accomplished. It's about the text on the ballot before you all. So we urge you to learn more, to visit websites, get information, and ultimately to join the coalition and vote no on what is perhaps a well-intentioned but a deeply flawed, costly tax on sales. Thank you for your time and happy, look forward to answering your questions. Thank you both very much. We'll begin our question and answer session in just a moment. But first, I'd like to thank the business and in-kind sponsors whose support helps to make City Club possible. Thank you to our gold sponsors, Network Charter School, Hudson Dental, Louvis Cobb, and the Lane Transit District. Thank you also to our in-kind sponsors, KRVM 91.9 Radio, Dot Dotson's Photography, Pack Info, and Kid Sports. Also, a special thank you to our award-winning public radio station, KLCC-FM 89.7, for airing City Club programs Monday nights at 7 p.m. For those listening at home or in the car right now, your household is one of several thousand tuning into City Club on KLCC, and we love that you are here. You can find all recent City Club programs archived on KLCC, as well as on our YouTube channel and as podcasts. We'll be right back with KLCC's Rachel McDonald for our question and answer period. Thank you.
You're listening to the City Club of Eugene. I'm Rachel McDonald with KLCC, and we are talking about Measure 118 on the November ballot. We're joined by Antonio Gisbert, who is the author of Measure 118, and Angela Wilhelms, who is with Defeat Costly Tax on Sales Coalition, who opposes Measure 118. So we'll go ahead and start with questions, and um, some of these questions I'll be for, will, will be for each of you, and some will be slightly differently phrased for each of you. Um, to start with, just why, for Antonio, why not use a corporate tax to provide funds for schools or social programs in Oregon? Thank you for the question. Um, that's a great idea, and uh, it's been done before. There's plenty Maybe of... Maybe a little bit louder. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you for the question. That's a great idea. Um, we definitely believe that school and basic services should be appropriately funded, and importantly, Measure 118 is revenue neutral, does not take any money away from any of those programs, no matter what you've heard, but in fact, it, in, it improves how all those programs are gonna be, right? When we reduce, for example, when we reduce child poverty by half, all of our kids are gonna learn more easily. We know that um, if you're an educator, you know that um, a, a big part of educational achievement is, is related to uh, the, the economic stability that kids uh, have at home. So indirectly, Mission 118, for example, helps schools and helps teachers. Um, also to say that um, there are already plenty of special interest groups, um, labor unions and, and other orgs, whose uh, primary consideration is increasing funding for, for example, public ed. And we feel that it is not our lane, but their lane to that work. And Angela, a similar question, if, if there were to be a specific tax on corporations, can you see that being a useful thing if it were put into social services or used in a different way? So actually in 2019, the legislature adopted the corporate activity tax, which is a gross receipts tax of a different structure that funds the Student Success Act. Um, so that, that exists. But I think it's important to remain focused on the conversation before voters today. Uh, voters weren't given a hypothetical scenario. They were given a very specific proposal, one that I understand the, the proponents um, don't agree with this, but one that every person who works on the budget in Salem agrees will cut the state's general fund by billions of dollars a year. It's, it's a very obvious uh, piece of this. It's been interpreted by counsel for the state. In addition, those groups that were mentioned, the, the teachers union, public employee unions of other sorts, various local governments themselves have all come out in opposition to this because they believe it has a negative effect on the delivery of social services and the welfare of, of youth as well as seniors and others who rely on those critical services. That is a question I wanted to ask you, Antonio, is um, based on the state's analysis, the, the Measure 18 could cost Measure 118 could cost Oregon well over $1 billion in future budget cycles that could, it could have otherwise used to fund uh, things like schools and healthcare. So, so what is your response to that analysis? Thank you for the question. Um, I don't think that everybody in this room agrees 100% of the time with the decisions that our elected legislators make all the time, and that's totally fine. But I do believe in their in their competence and, and well intention. It, it sort of, when I talk to folks about this, it sort of defies logic that we're proposing Measure 118 to, that's gonna bring in an, a new seven, about $7 billion of revenue every year. And it, it defies logic. And, and that's not my number, that's a, the Legislative Revenue Office number. It defies logic that the state legislature would not be able to plug a $1 billion hole when they have $7 billion sitting on the table next to them. Now, it's, this is really important. We designed Measure 118 to be revenue neutral. So we think that if there's a legitimate cost associated with the measure, that the new revenue should pay for it. But that's only a legitimate cost, not like some 
completely random thing. We, we scaffolded the rebate program on existing um, state, uh, things that the state already does. So for example, um, sending out uh, kicker checks. It, and there's been talk about the Department of Revenue needing 200, uh, 199 new employees to issue uh, th these rebate payments that the vast majority of them are gonna be paid out when people file taxes. So we, we don't really, see, we see that $1 billion number as a little bit exaggerated and inflated, but if that is in fact the real cost, Measure 18 is designed so that that cost is covered by the new revenue. So the, the idea is that Oregonians or um, people in Oregon would be issued this check um, from the from the money that's raised from this tax. Um, Angela, what do you think? How do you think people will use this money? I think money can be will be used uh, very differently depending on the circumstances. So there's a lot of talk about how it's going to immediately get infused back into the economy, but this this rebate is not means tested. So everybody gets the rebate. I get the rebate and I will admit I don't need it. So so folks who don't need it or need to infuse or spend the money right away might save it. So that that economic regeneration does not happen. Some might use it for everyday household items. But those household items are going to cost more. They're going to have to pay federal taxes on this. And again, if the legislature chooses to fill the hole with the revenue, which is, which is up to them, it's not automatic in the measure, if they choose to do that, that again lowers the rebate amount. So the idea that there's this set amount of money that, that folks are going to be getting is, is just, it, it's a really unfortunate and, and false promise to people. And Antonio, same question for you. What do you think people will will use this money for? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we have a pretty good idea of what people will use the money for because a similar program in Alaska has been working for about 42 years. It's called the Alaska Farm Fund Dividend. And that's been studied extensively. And by and large, or like mostly, people use the money to meet their everyday needs. Uh, one of the statistics that um, that I find most most um, sur sur surprising is that in, in Alaska, when the permanent dividends go out, all the local businesses uh, they like uh, announce sales. So come spend your dividend check here, right? That it, that gets the local economy going, and the one category of purchases that always spikes more than any other category of purchases in Alaska is uh, kids' clothes. And so what happens in Alaska is that the those, those payments go out right before winter, and everybody goes out and buys coats uh, for their kids. So people use their money well. We trust people to use the money uh, the, the best they can. I'm gonna touch on the universality of the program that is really important. A universal program costs about, to means test the program, it costs between five and 10% of the total program co cost, which is, a, which is expense we did not want to incur because it's expensive and secondly, it is classist and racist and like generally like not good. But also because of the way the organ rebate structured, if you cut out the top 1%, like the millionaires, right? Then you really only increase the value of the rebate by about $16 for everybody else. It doesn't seem worthwhile. And you can, we have this table, you can work your way down, even if you exclude the top tax bracket, like Angeles, for example, that only increases the value of the rebate for everybody else by about $39. So to means that this benefit imposes a huge cost, it excludes a bunch of people as it happens with the EITC, it excludes a whole bunch of people who are equally deserving, who are rightly deserving of the benefit, and also it doesn't really help anybody else that much more. So that's why we did it that way. And keep the keep the microphone because I want to ask you, Antonio. This is something that Angela brought up, and that other critics of Measure 118 have mentioned: is that this will probably lead to corporations passing the cost of the tax on to consumers. So, what's to stop that from happening? Let's remember that corporations say that all the time. They s <laughs> thank you. 
So they said that when we increased the minimum uh, wage in Oregon, they said that when we tried to pass the CAT tax, when we passed, passed the tax, blah, passed the CAT tax, forgive me. And they're saying that now. But importantly, we also know, as we just saw in a federal trial in Portland, uh, Kroger trying to merge with uh, Albertsons, that these giant corporations are actually just um, uh, increasing prices way above what would be required by like mere inflation to, to extract the most profit possible. And so it's really not like inflation or taxes that determine corporate prices, or it's really price gouging uh, driven by greedflation. And I think it's like we need to be really honest about this and like not let giant corporations or the representatives bully us into voting out of fear. You know, let's vote yes, let's be courageous, and let's build a society that is more fair for all of us. I mean, we pay way more in taxes, like the 64% of Oregon's budget is paid for by personal income tax. Meanwhile, corporations pay about 14%. That is completely upside down. Like, we should stop that. And Measure 118 is a modest first step in turning that around. Well, Angela, I'd love to hear your response to that. And, and could it, is it more of a fear tactic to say that corporations would pass this on to consumers? It, it's not. If it makes people afraid or worried, it's because prices are going to go up, but it's not a tactic, it's a, it's a fact. I've heard from a number of business owners who are going to pass this on to consumers. A lot of businesses, take grocery stores for example, operate on a profit margin of one to three percent. This is not a tax on income or profit, this is a tax on gross sales, it eradicates those profit margins. The Willamette Valley Cancer Institute here in Eugene is opposed to this measure because not only are they gonna pay more on the incoming drugs that they use to treat cancer patients, they themselves will have to pay the 3% tax and they don't have that kind of margin. They can't absorb it. They also can't change the internal restructuring of you know, Medicaid reimbursements and things like that. Prices will go up. I mean, they have gone up tremendously in recent years as other laws have gone into effect, as the supply chain you know, throughputs have gotten more expensive. I think to say that a $7 billion a year tax is, is, a, is a small step forward, when again, that's 42.5% of the state's entire general fund budget right now. I mean, that is an extraordinary amount of money. And businesses also, the private sector, employs 1.7 million people across the state of Oregon. Those people have jobs, they are paying income taxes, they're paying local taxes. So it's, it's really an oversimplification of the tax system to isolate one particular thing and not look at the economy-wide impacts, which again is what nonprofits, social welfare organizations, left and right-leaning think tanks and taxpayer groups, labor unions, public and private, as well as businesses have all done in coming to the conclusion that this is not the path forward for Oregon. Okay. Thank you. What about people who are on a fixed income, who are elderly or disabled, and could lose their benefits if they go over federal income caps? Even if there is a mechanism to prevent them from being penalized, that might not be very easy to navigate. Um, we've seen, we saw that happen when um, the government sent out checks during the COVID pandemic. So I guess we'll start with you, Angela, just to keep things balanced, but I wanna hear from Antonio on this as well. Yeah, of course, I think this is a really big concern. There is a hold harmless provision, but I, I um, encourage people, if you have time, to go and listen to the House Revenue Committee and the Senate Revenue Committee meetings that were held last week with the Chief Revenue Officer and some state agency um, information that he had about this exact issue. The legislators were very interested, and I, I think it was Representative Pam Marsh from Ashland, but I can't recall off the top of my head who asked specifically about this question. The state doesn't know how it's going to administer this. This, this law becomes effective January 1, less than two months after the election, and the state's own agencies have said they have no way of estimating or calculating. So for example, someone 
someone becomes ineligible at the state level because of income for, for some of the Oregon Health Authority benefits. How do you make that person whole? Is it, is it a flat payment? Is it they incur the expenses and you reimburse them for it? Is it you put out an estimate and then there's a true up at the end or, or not? I, I mean, the, these are questions that, that professionals in this space do not have answers to because it is so complicated. I understand it was meant to be simple, but it is exceedingly complicated when you get into the administration and the relationship with the federal flow of money. I mean, this, this is one of the most complex parts of the state budget, uh, and this will only exacerbate that, and I, th I think to the detriment of the people who are supposed to be receiving those benefits. Would you like me to restate the question? Basically, for people on fixed income, how might this affect their ability to receive federal benefits? Yeah, th thank you. So it, it's important to keep in mind that Alaska has been doing this for about 40 years. And, and we can do hard things. And so I would say, step one, let's reach out to our friends in Alaska, figure out how they manage benefits relative to the federal government, and then start from there. We have time to do this, right? Yes, corporations will, have to, will start paying the higher tax rate on January 1, 2025, but the rebates only go out in 2026. So there's a whole calendar year and a long legislative session for us to figure out all these details. There is time. The sky is not going to fall. Corpora giant corporations should pay their fair share in taxes. And importantly, let's remember this is after $25 million. So that giant corporation still gets the first $25 million of revenue from Oregon essentially tax-free. And importantly, our local businesses will not have to pay the 3% at all because $25 million a year is $68,000 every single day. That is not the local owner-operated business at all. Oh, I'm sorry, for benefits, forgive me. <laughs> um, we have multiple levels of protection for folks receiving benefits, income-based benefits. But more importantly, and we think that like if you go through them, it, it makes sense. But importantly, the way we do benefits in this state, in this country, uh, through means testing, is like highly problematic, classist, racist, and like really needs to be revamped from the get-go. I think that the Measure 118 is a nice converse, conversation starter to do this better for the people who need uh, the, the most help now. We can do this. Thank you. Uh, Antonio, why don't you hold on the mic? Um, according to the Oregonian and Oregon Public Broadcasting reporting, you've been funded by some out-of-state entities. What is their interest in Measure 118? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, like I mentioned before, you know, when we started this ballot initiative over at like Theo's Coffee Shop, we had like zero money. Uh, perhaps the most naive thing I've done in the past six years is that to start a ballot initiative, you need two things. You need, you need to fill out a form with the Secretary of State, and you need a bank account. And I walked my way over to a credit union with a crispy $20 bill, and I was like, bang, <laughs> let's do a ballot initiative. Okay, so like any other like grassroots organization, you, you fundraise. For the first two and a half years of this work, everybody was unpaid and volunteer. We realized that that model was not going to work. So we, we doubled down on fundraising, and it's a huge success. I think that we should all be proud of in this community, that from extremely modest beginnings in local coffee shops, we've managed to raise like three quarter million dollars to get this thing on the ballot after collecting 170,000 signatures. Uh, the, f the majority of our funders now are folks who care about universal basic income, which is a related idea, and we welcome their support. Uh, th most of these folks are in California, and that's totally fine. It's a super wealthy state, right? $700,000 in California is like not what it is in Oregon, apparently. 
and that's that's totally fine. The fact that we've been able to be successful fundraising is is a good thing, not a bad thing. And of course, because they, these folks are from California, they're not going to get a rebate. So thank you. Sorry. <laughs> and Angela, just to, to would you share how the opposition campaign is being funded? Yeah. So um, we when we saw that they were gathering signatures at a more rapid pace and were very likely to qualify, um, we started talking to our coalition and we opened our pack in late June once the measure was, was qualified. And we're very proud of the fact that 78% of the money we've raised is from Oregon. Nine, over 90% of the money used to put this on the ballot was from California, from people who don't get a rebate, you're right, but they also don't pay the tax. Um, they don't pay for the higher prices the tax will cause, et cetera. So the, there's a variety of companies that one of the best things, and, and I've said this um, as we've worked on campaign finance legislation, the best things about Oregon's campaign finance laws is it's completely transparent. So folks can go to ORSTAR, O-R-E, STAR, which is the Secretary of State searchable database, and they can look up our contributors. We're in what's called seven-day reporting, so that information is updated every couple days um, to be current. All of our con all of our contributors, all of our expenditures are listed on there. Uh, so Antonio, let's. Uh, this was actually a question from an audience member who wanted you to talk more about how uh, this would reduce childhood poverty and bring people out of poverty. Um, thank you for the question. Um, Cash reduces poverty the same way that food reduces hunger. It's as simple as that. Um, we trusted everyday Oregonians with the ideas to draft the ballot initiative. We trusted everyday Oregonians to collect signatures. We trusted everyday Oregonians to sign the petition. We trust everyday Oregonians to vote yes. And we also trust everyday Oregonians to spend their rebates however it is best for them. If this is like the program in, in, in Alaska, which we think it is, the vast majority of the money is going to get spent in just making ends meet, right? Kids' clothes, things like that. Sure, somebody might fly to Switzerland and go skiing with their 1600 bucks, but more likely families will just go out to the coast for the weekend, right? And of course, that money gets circulated back into our economy, and we all do better. Um, the local Airbnb is not going to have to jack up their prices because they probably do not do. Um, sorry, they say the local bed and breakfast. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> the local bed and breakfast in the coast or a hotel probably doesn't do sixty-eight thousand dollars worth of business a day every single day of the year. Uh, but this infusion of cash is going to help. It's going to help the owners of that local business. It's going to help their employees, and it's going to help the people who like take that vacation if they want to, or the people who just like are able to like catch up on their credit card bills or whatever else they're doing. We, we've actually heard from from some owners of very small inns and hotels along the coast who oppose this measure because while they may not pay the tax directly, and we've been very clear about that. Well, you know it's. Many businesses, most businesses, will not pay the tax directly. But they're concerned because the insurance they pay for their, the health insurance they buy for their employees, the insurance they buy for their business, the insurance they buy for their property, the internet service so that their customers can have Wi-Fi or they can operate their, their own you know, website, the, the digital advertising they might do to, to draw people over to the coast to come visit them the paper products they, they use. A lot of um, small independent restaurants and hotels get their products and food and services from larger distributors because there's something about bulk pricing that, that makes a difference. All of, those all of those vendors will pay this tax directly and pass those on so that the, the, the dismissive nature of the conversation around the impact on small businesses is, is frustrating um, and I because I hear from them every day you're from local chambers of commerce, um, you know, businesses in, in small towns, big towns, farmers, again, doctors, 
uh, who are all concerned not because they're going to have to pay this tax directly, but because they know they're going to pay for it indirectly. And they can't absorb it in their profit margins, so they can cut other costs. Usually that ends up being labor. Or they can pass those prices on to consumers. Or they can sell to a bigger corporation or close their business. I think it also gets lost sometimes because there's, there's so much to talk about in this measure that the legislative revenue report that we've talked about before also notes that there will be a reduction in jobs, in wages, in income. And I, I just, we don't see how that combined with higher prices and the uncertainty of what this could be even for people who, who may or may not get the money, um, we, we don't see how that all adds up to a recipe for greater prosperity. And Toddy, do you want to respond to that? I mean, do, do you see how that, do you, this idea that even if a business is not directly being taxed by this measure, that they could still be affected because of their relation, because the fact that they're in, they're related to all these other larger businesses that are supplying them and. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised by like, that, that sounds a lot like, with all the respect, it sounds a lot like, like small ball, right? Well, we're talking about reducing child poverty by half. And then like the opposition is talking about the cost of napkins. Okay, well, I mean, bo both are important and maybe corporate greed is not just reserved for the giant corporations. Maybe, the, maybe a small, medium-sized business like really cares a lot about making the absolute most amount of money that, that, they, that they might make and, and that's okay. But I mean, if the cost of napkins goes up, remember that um, what we're doing is, um, uh, what, what we're doing is the opposite of trickle down economics, right? Or Reaganomics. Reaganomics would cut taxes on the giant corporations and leave people to the, do the best they can. That's what we've been getting for the past, since Reagan. Right? What we're doing is that we're infusing a bunch of cash into our economy, empowering everyday people to spend it the best they can. So, you know, if if the coffee shop wants to in, wants to increase their the price of coffee because their napkins or their cups cost a little bit more, you know, that's their prerogative. That's that that's fine. But remember, we're all going to have an extra sixteen hundred bucks to absorb that cost if it's applied fairly. Or we can take our 1600 bucks to a different business that doesn't uh, jack up prices unnecessarily. So in, in the end, in the end, there's, it, it sort of defies logic to say that if we're all $7 billion richer, if the economy of Eugene is $286 million more vibrant every year, it defies logic to say that we're going to be worse off. Like that's not how economies work at all. During the pandemic, we got a bunch of money to keep the economy going. This is just about the same thing, except that hopefully no more COVID and it's gonna be every year. <laughs> and it's gonna be paid for and not like based on debt. So thank you. We have time for just one more question. Um, Antonio, I guess I, I kind of wanna push back a little bit on what you said because a lot of small businesses are on the margins. I mean, we've seen just in the past few weeks in Eugene, a couple of restaurants close because they just are still recovering from the pandemic. Um, so there's, I mean, it is. it feels a little flippant to talk about the cost of napkins when like it, it does have, could have to do with the cost of employing, um, you know, a cook or a baker or someone to work at the counter in a, in a bakery, for example. So I guess I'm just pushing back a little bit because um, if there is an impact that's being passed on to smaller businesses, it seems like that will affect their ability to survive. And that is a family as well, you know. Yes, uh, fair enough. Like any, any business has a, a bunch of different costs, whether it is the Wi-Fi, the credit card processing fee, et cetera, right? And to blame the closure of that business 
on a 3% tax on, a, on some other set of corporations that are mostly from out of state. It, it seems like we're, we're directing our anger in, in the wrong direction. I mean, again, that, that restaurant that unfortunately closed, right? If Measure 18 had been around, the, the owners of that restaurant, the employees of that restaurant would have gotten the rebates. Every one of their customers would have gotten the rebate. Maybe people would have gone and, and, and maybe people would have gone out there and eaten there one more time, right? And that would have like increased their bottom line and it should have been, it would have been better for the, that restaurant. If people have, m when people have more money, they tend to spend it, and they spend it in, like, ideally in local businesses. Let's give, oh, go ahead, and then we'll just wrap things up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, look, I'm not angry. I'm sad for those businesses. You're right, Rachel. They're on the margin, um, and that's why, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Antonio, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe a single small business is support a, has, has come out and endorsed this measure, you know, they are they are nervous. They are um, anxious about the economy overall, just like households are everywhere. And so, to to say that redirecting the conversation is, is a redirect is is actually completely missing the fact that economies are complex. I mean, it's, it's an ecosystem. It's, there's relationships between large and small companies. There's relationship between consumers and companies of all sizes. And, and so the, the simplistic notion that we can just snap our fingers in Oregon and poof, $7 billion is going to show up in the economy, that's just not how it works. That money comes from somewhere, and ultimately it's going to come from consumers who, who bear the, the brunt of... Taxes again. When you tax sales, this is not high, this is nothing more than high school economics. You tax sales, consumers pay more, and that's what's going to happen here. But it's not the only negative consequence that stems from this measure. I don't want to lose sight of the budget cuts, the complexity in this, the benefits conversation, etc. There, there are a lot of deep flaws in this measure, and, and I think it's it. You know, the the small business impact is a huge and important one that we shouldn't lose sight of either. Thank you so much to both of you. This has been a really great conversation and hopefully it helps everyone as they look to make their choices. Thank you for having us. That is all the time we have for today. Please join me one more round of applause for our panelists. Great to hear from both of you. This has been our October 4th, 2024 conversation at the City Club of Eugene. Next week, we are proud to host a forum featuring all four candidates for Oregon's 4th Congressional District in Congress. We think this is the only time they're all getting together, so you won't want to miss that one. Last but not least this week, we are beginning to plan our Gifts to the City program, where we bring together a diverse group of residents who offer a gift to the city. It's one of our most beloved traditions here at City Club, and so if you know of an area resident who should be nominated to bestow a gift, a theoretical gift, that is. Drop us a line at cityclubeugene at gmail.com. Thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend.